about time for us to begin with our Bible class. If you got your Bible, go ahead and turn to James chapter 3. This is where we're going to be. Uh, in just a few minutes, we'll finish up with Romans 12, and then we'll get into James chapter 3. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and turn there in your Bible or pull it up on your tablet, uh, you can go ahead and do so. Uh, this is my last portion of our class. Jeff will be teaching uh, the, next, uh, the next week as we close out our summer quarter uh, and the, uh, the topic that we've had for the summer that we've been looking at, at the kingdom of God uh, and specifically life within the kingdom. Uh, and, and Jeff has been giving us a, on his portion of the class just a, a big overview of what the kingdom is and 
uh, that the kingdom has been around as long as God has been around, because God is king, uh, so it's eternal. So looking at it from uh, both testaments, uh, and then I've been handling the practical portion, which we've entitled Just Lives Within the Kingdom. Uh, We've got to live a certain kind of life if we're going to be within the kingdom, and that's what we've been uh, putting under the microscope. Uh, So this morning, we're going to look at James chapter 3, and we're going to look at how we need to operate by a different kind of wisdom uh, than the world around us, that one of the identity markers of God's people will be how they live, not just uh, individually, but how we live collectively, how we live as a group. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Father, we are grateful for today, and we're grateful to you for the first day of the week. Uh, It was on this day so many years ago uh, that you resurrected your son, Uh, and we gather uh, on the first day of the week, as so many Christians are doing now and have done in years past, to remember that your son, even though he died on the cross, was resurrected three days later, Uh, and that uh, his resurrection was the beginning uh, of of everything uh, that Uh, impacts this world, that it is the moment on which world history has changed. And uh, we are grateful for the resurrection uh, as it stands as a reality and there are many evidences and proofs for it, but also for the fact that it changes our lives from the inside out as well. And we're grateful for that. It's on the resurrection that we have our hope. Uh, It's on the resurrection that we know no matter what's going on in this world uh, that we find stability and certainty and uh, ultimately know that Uh, All things work together for good because your son came out of the tomb. We thank you uh, that we have the opportunity to gather on the first day of the week to remember this and to remember each other and to encourage each other with this and to build one another up uh, through mutual encouragement and at this moment, mutual study of your word. Bless our time together this morning in our class. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so I left you off last week uh, that Romans chapter 12, we wanted to leave off and give, just kind of give you some homework to be thinking about. Uh, but in Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 14, Paul will essentially say uh, that, we, uh, that we need to, when it comes to us in the kingdom, from an external point of view, we need to owe no person anything but to love them. And so verses 8 through 14 is essentially a section about love. But I left you with the question, that second bullet point, and we're just going to speed kind of through this because the rest of our time will be in James 3. But why is love our debt? As as people of the kingdom, whether internally or externally, with other people, why is love our debt? Why is love our debt? Okay, all right. So it's rooted in not just God, because he is love, but what God has done in and through Jesus, die, dying on the cross, uh, the resurrection, uh, and that it's, it's so great in terms of its magnitude uh, that we can't pay it back. So, there, so Paul will use this language, the Spirit will use this language of debt, of, of monetary language. And it goes back beyond that. Okay. From the very beginning, he loved us. Okay. So even before the events of the cross, uh, even before the foundation of the world, everything is about love because that is who he is. What else? Why is love our debt? The creation of the world is God's love for mankind. He did not have to make us. He chose to make us. Even though he understood what kind of people we would end up being, he still chose to do it. Okay, all right. So creation... Salvation, all aspects of, of the fact they come from love, his love for everybody and everything. Okay? Why else is love our debt? He created us in his image. Okay. As spiritual beings, and so that's an expression of how we can represent what he's done for us. Ah, okay. So being made in his image, in not just being created in general, but being specifically created in his image, we're going to have that capacity to love. We love because he first loved us, is what another apostle will tell us. Why else is love our debt? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because it, through our sharing our love with others, they know that we are disciples of him and, and that we are loving one another. So it's not that we are loving God, but we are loving one another. 
bring people to him. Okay, and that's a great, great point. And Jesus says as much in the upper room that, you know, by your love for each other, everybody's going to know. Uh, there won't be doubt. Uh, and then also, it's part of our responsibility. The way that God brought us to him is through love, obviously, and sacrifice. The way we would bring others, which is our ultimate mission, which is the, the mission of the kingdom. Uh, we're going to bring others because of how we love them and in the ways in which we love them. Anybody else? Why is love our debt? To make it just a, a, a tad bit materialistic, it's the only currency we have. Ah. We have nothing that we can, you know, material stuff, God already made it. It, it is the one thing that we have that we can give back. Ah, that is a great, great point. Uh, and I'm glad you mentioned it. It is a currency. It, it's what we have in our pocket. It's, it's what we carry around with us. It's how a transaction is made. Paul, the Spirit's going to use this language on purpose, and in part because you have the capacity to pay something back. It's going to look different with everybody, but at the core, love is what is going to move that and um, promote it. Anybody else? Adam? When God Yep. When we die, our soul returns back to Him. And, and so there's, there's the love connection why we need to share that love with others because we are part of God. We are part of Him. And then, so not only created in His image in terms of spiritual beings, but then we're recreated in Jesus. When, when we respond, when we obey the, the gospel, we're recreated in His image. Um, everyone who's in Christ is a new creation. Uh, so now we're motivated by, by, by something completely different than we were before Jesus, and love is that motivation. And love is the obligation as well. Uh, part of the reason why love is our debt is that there are some times and some days where I don't want to love somebody else. Well, regardless of whether I like it or not, in two weeks, the first of the month's going to come, and any of us who have credit cards or whatever, that bill's coming. Uh, whether I like it or not, it's coming. I will get the statement in the email. It will be auto-drafted. Whatever that is, the obligation is there. And sometimes the only way for us to do something, whether we like it or not, is to know that there's an obligation. This is just the way that it is. And love is our debt. Now, hopefully we would mature and we would grow and to the point of seeing the value of love and not just simply gritting our teeth and bearing it and just, well, I have to do it, that we see the currency. We see what God has done. The other reason, and I'll leave you with this thought, uh, from a debt perspective, is any of us who have ever had debt, or if you got debt now from, uh, from a money perspective, the urgency to get out from under it. Right? That's the idea that the sooner we can get out from under it, uh, car payments a necessary debt, house payments a necessary debt, but it doesn't mean that I don't want to get out from under it. You know, so we'll adjust everything else in our life so that we can get out from under that debt. I wonder what it would look like for our entire life to be readjusted so that today I woke up with the obligation and the debt to love and I'm going to reorder everything else to ensure that I can get out from under that. Not so I don't have to do it, but so that I can actually do what Jesus wanted me to do, and that's love others the way that he has loved me. There should be a sense of urgency to love. There should be a strategy to love. There should be an adjustment to love. There, that word debt, I sat with that this week because any of us who have that, saddled with debt, whatever that is, even if we do all that we can to avoid it, once it's there, our life is guided by that. And we want to do all that we can to free that up. Um, I wonder what that would look like, spiritually speaking, for us to have, wake up every morning with the sense of urgency to love someone the way that God has loved me. With the intention to love them the way that God has loved me. With the plan to love them the way that God has loved me. These, this is a good way. Uh, this is something I'd encourage you to sit with. Uh, and really think through uh, however you think of terms of your financial debt, 
Love is our debt, and uh, that just grabbed my attention. So let's turn to James chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 13 through 18. James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. So just a couple of things. When We're going to read this, but I'd like to, um, I'd like to ask a couple of things before we read the passage. Uh, one, somebody give me a definition of wisdom. This passage is about wisdom. James is a book about wisdom. Uh, so give me a definition of wisdom. What is it? Okay. Knowledge applied. Okay. Fear of God. The Bible will tell us it's the beginning of it. Okay. What else? Anybody else have a definition? <laughs> okay. <laughs> that is wisdom. I probably learned the hard way to not put it in there, but that's nonetheless, but that's a really, really good way to be able to put it. So from a positive standpoint, it's having knowledge and then knowing what to do it. And from a negative, hopefully I've, I've learned it, so it's experienced. Uh, I like the aspect that wisdom is being able to live with skill on this earth. Uh, from a, everybody, can, everybody here knows what a saw is, but a lot of us may not be skillful with a saw. Uh, everybody may know you know, what a computer is, but you may not be skillful in writing code. There's, there's an aspect of that. Yes? Okay, all right. So knowledge can be taught. You're right. It can be learned. Information, back and forth. Uh, but wisdom cannot. Sometimes you just got to live, live it out uh, and learn uh, just what that is. Uh, so uh, I like the, the uh, I've always liked the knowledge, it's having knowledge and the knowing what to do with that knowledge, um, with that. So what's the value? What's the value and the essentialness of wisdom? The, the Bible will go out of its way in both testaments to tell us that wisdom is essential. You just can't live uh, life on here. So what's the value and the essentialness of it? It proves you're not foolish. Okay. All right. It's, it, when you look at the Proverbs, so uh, Miss Maybell mentioned Proverbs one seven that the beginning of wisdom uh, is the fear of the Lord, uh, but fools despise. The latter half of that verse tells us fools despise. So it does show to us. Yeah. So you're right. It just shows that there's not a foolishness to it. Now sometimes foolishness exists because of ignorance, and sometimes foolishness exists because I just don't care about the other aspect. But nonetheless, you're right. It makes a clear distinction. Uh, between two types of individuals. You learn how to interact with other people in different situations. Okay. And it's going to have interaction with people. That is where, really where uh, wisdom is going to, the rubber meeting the road. Um, and in some cases, the only way to learn how that is, is to interact with people. But there, there are some principles that can guide us prior to that interaction. Yes. Okay, in a lot of cases, outside of interaction with people, wisdom is mostly used for decision making. Well, tell me the last time you lived 24 hours without having to make a decision. It's essential and it's valuable because there is always life under the sun every day, big, little, doesn't matter. It's all about decisions. So uh, decision making and then obviously uh, interaction with people. Were you going to say something? Uh, you already said it, guy. Okay. Yes. It's going to be one, and that's a really good point. I, uh, that is a good addition to that. It's not a. I, it's not like I can avoid being foolish. If I avoid wisdom, if I avoid knowledge, if I avoid all of those things, then this is what happens. Um, I can't be one or the. I, I can't be either one. I, you know, I will. I will have something like that. So the value and the essentialness of wisdom. Uh, next softball question, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll read the passage. Uh, in general, where's our society going for wisdom? Again, this is softball, so it should be fairly easy. But in general, where's our society going for wisdom? Mostly each other. Okay, mostly each other. A mirror. A mirror, okay. So in a lot of cases, it's always been this way. We've just kind of pump, pumped it with steroids. I've, I've gone internally. 
Um, you know, so uh, the, we're doing the opposite of Proverbs 3, 5. Instead of trusting in the Lord with all of our heart and leaning not on our own understanding, we've reversed it. I'm leaning on my own understanding and I'm trusting what I'm finding in there. Yes. Okay. So, it, it helps to get it from another point of view. And and he, he's full of wisdom. It does. <laughs> and, and what I would say, I wrote it on my notes, is that we're going to other people, but I'm actually going to the people that I already know will agree with me. So, I, I, because I don't want the opposing view. I don't want the opposite. I don't want the other perspective. So, not only am I going to each other, but I'm very selective because I don't want somebody to tell me the opposite. Uh, because I've already determined if you tell me the opposite, you don't have my best interest at heart. So we, we would need that. Anybody else? Where else are we going? On social media and the internet. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So we're going, we're crowdsourcing is kind of the buzzword for the last five, seven, ten years or so. Uh, but we're, we're going just internet in general, and there are some things that are beneficial. It's good to be able to type in a, 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 a do-it-yourself video, I, how do I do blank in YouTube, and it can give you that. Uh, but the problem is, is that we're just assuming that the person on the other side of the screen or the other side of whatever's been posted, uh, one, knows what they're talking about, and then again, two, has my best interest at heart. Yes? Something about Instead of saying, what do you think, which is truly asking you your opinion, so many times we'll say, don't you think that, yeah. which is asking them to agree with you. Yeah. So even our language reflects a lot of this. So I, I want us to look at this, and I want us to approach it from a collective point of view as a group, because as churches, we're not immune to a false wisdom. Churches are not immune to an ungodly wisdom. Happens most of the time when we talk about wisdom, we think of it in terms of our individual lives. Uh, but it can happen to churches, can it? It does happen to churches. Oh, go ahead. In, in, in my work, when I was working, I was alarmed and, just, and woke up to the uh, generations I know I'm going to sound like an old man, but the generations that are younger would go to the collective wisdom of the internet called AI. AI is only as good as the input. They would go to chat GPT and to discover questions of how to make decisions for the future before they would consult those who have done it the last 25 years. And they would actually rely on chat GPT, which is, again, it's just it's, it's an enormous collective wisdom of the mass. Yep. Right? So that's where wisdom is. It's collected of the masses. And they would go to there for their answer and argue with us who had done it for 25 years that this is the, this is the wisdom, this is the way to go. I was alarmed, actually. Yep. And, and the awareness is, is that's not, probably not far from the younger folks in our own family, in our own church. Right? They're, they're less likely to trust the old person and more likely to trust the masses of the Internet. Oh, sure. Sure. Because uh, I can find for a variety of reasons, but you mentioned AI. Even uh, part of Grace's syllabus this week was there was a section from her teacher on how, you know, AI procedures, AI protocols, uh, stuff that didn't exist this time last year. I mean, this, it, that, and of course, others of you that are teachers or uh, you probably already noticed that as well. Yes. That's not exactly a new thing either because after Solomon made Revolve King, the people are like, lessen our load, and he goes to, he, he talks to his father's advisors, and they say he's up on the work, and they'll, they'll, they'll follow you. And then he goes to like his drinking buddies, and they say, you're going to make him, make him pay, make him show that you're more powerful than your father, and he listened to his drinking buddies. He didn't listen to the wisdom of the people who came before yep. So it, it's, it's always there, and the thing is, again, is a lot of the time when we talk about wisdom, it has to do with us individually. I want to approach this passage with all of us together. 
because the kingdom can end up using a false kind of wisdom. The kingdom can end up using something else. Now, we're not supposed to. I'm going to assume a couple of things, but I'll go ahead and verbalize them, and I'm going to spend time on them. I would hope that everybody here knows that the source of wisdom is the book you hold in your hands. It's not me standing up here. I would hope that that is the case that everybody here. Two, I would hope that that means that we know we are to conform individually and collectively to what is stated in the book. That's not, I would hope that. I, again, maybe I shouldn't be making the assumption. I am for the sake of time. Uh, I would hope that at the end of the day, that the source of everything that makes us, us as God's people, will be the book in your hand. And that the last person, we're talking about crowdsourcing, would not be me, and it would not be a preacher that you find on YouTube, or a podcast, or a blog, and that it would not be in your own eyes either. Because it is very easy to look at what Scripture would teach on things and then reason it away because it just makes me uncomfortable or makes us uncomfortable. At the same time, I also want you to notice as I read this and you read along with me that James isn't going to mention anything about decision-making when it comes to wisdom in this passage. Doesn't mean that it doesn't imply to, uh, to decision-making. But actually, he's going to talk about the outward. In other words, how do I show, how do we show as kingdom that we're wise versus fool, fools in this? So I want you to read along with me, verses 13 through 18, and we'll ask some questions for discussion. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you, have been, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. But it is earthly, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. All right, so verses 14 through 16. What are the two types of wisdom that James gives us? And by the way, this is one of the reasons why we like James, because he doesn't deal with the gray. He, he's uh, black and white. This is the way that it is. So what are the two types of wisdom that he gives us, that he tells us that are available? There's only two. Yes, ma'am. Okay, wisdom from above, wisdom from below. So what are the four descriptions of the wisdom that are from below? I know you see three. I'm adding a fourth one, and it's, the fourth one is that it's from below. So he's giving us a, a spatial area, if you will, above, below. But what are the additional descriptions of this wisdom? Okay, those would be the fruit. What are the, what are the, pe what are the descriptions? It is from below. It is okay, demonic. It is unspiritual. It is earthly. Tell me about those four descriptions. Those are interesting. Again, the Spirit's moving James, so we know it's under inspiration. Tell me about those four descriptions. It's interesting. Okay, so it shows us that it's not just from an earthly as far as like a plant in a ground or trees or birds. Uh, it has to do with the flesh, has to do with the human beings that are operating by the flesh. What else? It has to do with human relations. 
emotions and 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 generally how to behave in that arena. We look at other things that we call wisdom, and we're not dealing with that here, I don't think. And you can correct me if I if I if I, if I <coughs> You said what kind of wisdom or what is it? I, I think it's that. It's relationship mm -hmm. and with God. That's yep. one that was escaping me. Yep. Yeah. Yes, it's a, it's a horizontal. When he does the above below, it's a horizontal, a vertical and a horizontal relationship and how we interact with each other and how we interact with the world. And in this case, it's, pe it's with other people. Um, again, notice it's not about decision making in this particular passage, even though it's implied. Uh, this has to do with the outside of the aspect. What is interesting to me, though, is that he goes ahead and tells us with this wisdom that either one, but especially the one from below, there are some forces and there are some sources that are driving this wisdom. Go ahead. Although it doesn't say it specifically, it, it, it all appears to be satanic. It's what the tools that Satan uses to get us away from God. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Uh, and which is fascinating. I mean, we just don't have time to really crack that open and explore. But he does tell us that as we live as a group, as, as the kingdom, as we live on this world, and we have a choice to what kind of wisdom we're going to live by as a group, that there is a demonic, there is an unspiritual, there is an earthly kind of wisdom and this is the path that it'll lead on, and this is what it'll do. So give, I gave some, uh, uh, put descriptions, give me some examples of an unspiritual, earthly, demonic wisdom. Give some examples. Yes? You can choose to be whoever you want to be. Okay, all right, so self, okay, so self is, is elevated to the top. Uh, again, always been the case, that's what, that's what uh, Satan did in the garden. You know, are you sure that he, he made Eve and then by virtue of that, Adam uh, elbowed their, their waves to the top of the list? Vengeance. Okay, so vengeance. someone acts out with vengeance. Okay. Pride. Idolatry. Idolatry. Okay. Don't like that. I, it's interesting he uses the word... Uh, natural and natural you know when we talk about the fight between the flesh and the spirit the flesh is natural the flesh chooses it's hungry it's going to go for hunger but the spirit says maybe hunger is not the best choice at this moment and so that you know when we follow what's natural we may run over somebody to get out of the rain okay that's not the right thing yep but it is natural to get out of the rain Yep. And what uh, any of you have, I know I have unspiritual in the English standard. Does anybody have the word sensual uh, in your, your version? The, the literal word that would be translated, and that's a better word than unspiritual, would be sensual. It's animalistic. It's kind of the idea that an animal is driven, you know, from its natural terms, but that's sensual. It's that an animal lives for whatever's right in front of it. So if it's hungry, don't care, I'll, I'll go two, three miles. A wolf will travel two, three miles on the hunt. That's, that's what it comes. So that's sensual. If you have sensual uh, and in your version, that's a better, that's a better capture of that, of that original term, uh, that somebody's being driven by this and motivated by this. Sometimes I think we hit at the low-hanging fruits on mm -hmm. this kind of... But this is the wisdom that has actually controlled the world for a long, long time. Yes. And it's very... Crafty. It is wisdom. It's obviously not a godly sense. But like, but if you think about Machiavelli, and he, he writes this book, The Prince, mm -hmm. he's giving all this wisdom of how to consolidate power and things like that. Yep. And people have studied that for generations. That that kind of wisdom has pulled the levers of power in in our world and our own country and things like that. It's it's actually a really frightening. Kind well, and, and I just asked the question because I know you've probably seen this as well as I do, uh, and it just needs to be stated from, from that. So the, con the consolidation of power and then how the human is elevated at the, at the top. So not just holding the power, but I'm the one that benefits directly from that. 
but the ugliness of this wisdom and the demonic. So how do we offer free abortions at a convention? This is, a, this is an unspiritual, sensual, it's a way to live. What Justin is talking about, it's a way to live. I got to live. We have to live. We have to operate. But at the same time, how do we offer pagan prayers at a convention? The, this is across the board with everything. And what the kingdom does, and this is exactly what Satan did with Jesus when he offered all the kingdoms of the world, is that I'm offering you power, and I'm offering you position, and I'm offering you prestige. I'm just offering it to you in a different way. Uh, go ahead. I don't know what the percentage is, but a very high percentage of the reason race is discussed, of the reason environmental issues is discussed, abortion is discussed, not because people care about it, it's because they know that's how they can get power. Mm -hmm. And they, that's... That's what I'm talking about. That's that wisdom. Yeah. That is, it's gross and it's evil, but that's no, not. It is, and if you think about it, it that's why, why James would just take us aback for a moment when he says demonic. Because what did Satan do when he took and convinced and fooled, you mentioned foolishness a minute ago, fooled Adam and Eve in the garden, who actually ended up having power over the human race? Satan did until he came, until Jesus came and broke that power through love and self-sacrifice. And I'm not talking about having power in the sense that he controls us like puppets, but once somebody had the power, he dictates from there and he uses and abuses everything. My point in highlighting all of this is that nothing is different 2,000 years later with the establishment of the kingdom. We're still offered, whether locally or individually, Worldwide, we're still being offered a piece of fruit that says, you can have power, do it this way. And this is why love is our debt, because love is the power of God used rightly instead of wrongly. Love is the outworking of, of wisdom. So we'll start with Alan and Keith and a few others. In my Bible, there's a reference to Jude 119 for the verses. And it says that these people are the ones who are creating divisions among you. They follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's spirit in them. So, it's not me like the, in the unspiritual part of this, this is just the way we're going to be if we don't have God. All these yep. things we're talking about doing, mm -hmm. it's just natural. Yeah. This is what we're going to do. The, this we is don't the, have God with us. That's right. This is how we're going to act, so should we really be surprised? Yeah. No, because this is just what, in that last bullet point, what are the four pieces of fruit? This is just what happens. This is just what it looks like. It don't have to work too very, uh, very hard because it just happens. This is without God, with God, this, this is just what happens. Keith? I think one of the worst things that will happen is division. Yep. He, he starts off with confusion or, or doubt and then ultimately leads to division. And as far as the church goes, that is the worst. It is. And, and looking at that last bullet point, uh, you mentioned one already. Uh, what are the four pieces of fruit of this wisdom? So we live as a group by what's earthly, what's unspiritual or sensual, what's demonic. What are the four pieces of fruit that happen? What's produced? And, and again, Alan is right. It's not like it's produced intentionally. This is just what's produced. An apple tree will always produce an apple. That's just the way it's designed. So this is that. But what are, you mentioned one already, but what are the other pieces of fruit? Envy, selfish ambition, and disorder in every evil practice. Yes, yes, it's the obvious ones uh, that he gives us. And he mentions, he mentions them twice, by the way. So he says in, in verse 13, I mean, verse 14, you have bitter jealousy. So it's not just jealousy, but this bitterness that's attached to it, this hatred, this bitterness. And then you got selfish ambition. And then he mentions it all over again in verse 16, jealousy and selfish ambitions. James, you, what's going on within the church? I wonder what's happening in the kingdom that he's writing to. What's happening in there? He mentions that twice. Um, Keith, I think you mentioned confusion. Mine says uh, disorder. It's kind of the idea, but confusion is what's at, at heart, and then every, um, every vile practice. Uh, go ahead, Adam and then John. Oh, go ahead. Well, one of the things is that 
when we talk about what is natural, the, the second law of thermodynamics basically says that it tends to go towards disorder. So if we follow what is natural, it's going to fall apart. And so I, you have to put a force. There has to be a force for good to keep from having disorder. Yes. Everything about the, the whole group of them, they lack God's moral values. There's this lack, there's something is missing. It's all about me and yep. nobody else. So yep. how you look at it, it's just me. I want and what I will acquire. Yep, it is. It, it, it elevates man to the very top. And that's the lie of it all. Uh, because Satan elevated Adam and Eve in their own eyes, and you will be like God once this happens, except that they weren't. It was, the, it was one of the biggest lies of, of multiple. I don't know how many of you uh, in the military, those of you that have military background, you ever heard of this acronym? If you've never heard of it, it was created back in World War uh, I, if I, if I remember correctly, World War II. But it was called Situation Normal, and it was all fouled up, and it was just when the radio came over, and uh, you're a soldier in the middle of the battle, and uh, you just didn't have time for, um, from your point of view, a dumb question. So you would sarcastically say, and the situation normal, all fouled up, you would just say snafu, if you will. Uh, that the idea is that, look, I don't have time to tell you how bad it is because you really know how bad it is. Things are just bad. Um, when we operate, when we operate by an earthly unspiritual, demonic wisdom. When God's people operate that way. John just mentioned this. We foul things up. We make a mess. Uh, the Pentagon, in their wisdom, decided to change it from this, and now it's referred to as this. I don't know if any of you know this acronym. Fouled up beyond belief. Now, if you were to ask somebody else who's probably not a Christian, they'll give you a different word. But it's fouled up beyond belief. The same thing with the other one, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, uh, there is a, but it's fouled up. And, and if you want to know how this impacts the kingdom, read the next five verses of chapter 4. Where do wars come from? Where do quarrels come from? Where do fights come from? It's because your passions are running out of control. Because your desires are running out of control and quite simply, you're acting like animals within the kingdom. Because you're operating internally, you're operating by something that God did not intend for you to operate by. So, the fruit and the foolishness of it all is that we think this is the path. When really that's not the path at all. And this applies in our life, this applies with our marriages, this applies with our children, this applies with our money, and this applies to the kingdom. We have a choice to make as a group. Do we operate and live by what God has given us, or do we do something different? And every time, from the very beginning, when we do something different, everything is messed up. Everything. The kingdom and her mission is too vital for us to operate by wisdom of below. We cannot operate that way. And like, you said, uh, like Keith mentioned a minute ago, when we have this among each other, when we have this among each other, we're no good for the world around us. No good. Light, the basket is put over the light. The candle is hidden and the salt loses its saltiness. Jesus didn't come so that we would intentionally foul things up by going the opposite direction. He didn't come so that we would sacrifice what He has done and the path that He has blazed for us because we want something else. Very quickly, how's the wisdom from above characterized? Well, notice again, at least in our specific passage, there is no, nothing about decision making. Verse 13 Good conduct. Verse 13, meekness. Go down, verse 17, pure. Peaceable. 
How about this one? Open to reason. Full of mercy. Good fruits. Impartial. Sincere. Fascinating. Sounds like a fruit of the Spirit, doesn't it? Very quickly, and I mentioned this, a Bible study tip is always to look at things and if they're repeated within close proximity to each other, the author's trying to emphasize. Peace is mentioned. Obviously, from the negative standpoint, selfish ambition and jealousy is mentioned very close together and is mentioned twice. Peace is mentioned twice. Why the emphasis on peace? Okay, it's what we want, what we desire the most in our homes, our lives, and obviously within the church and for the world too. We would pray for that. Why else? Peace is harder to make than it is to keep. Ah. It will always happen. Okay. So going to Alan's point from a negative standpoint, if we use the wisdom from above that's godly and all of those things, this is the natural fruit. Peace can't help but to be produced. And of course, all the other things too. Go ahead. Yes. Because it's not about me, it's about him. Yes. And that is a great reminder as we're closing out this class that the life, lives within the kingdom, every single one of us that wear the name of Jesus, it is about him. It is about God. And this is how we show. And we can invite others. You can operate by a different wisdom. And I believe our society is actually hungry and thirsty. They don't know they're hungry and thirsty for this. But they're actually hungry and thirsty for this. They're just looking in all the wrong places. And I empathize with that because I look in all, all the wrong places as well. Go ahead. Verse 17 is a sequence that we don't often capture. And, and that wisdom is first of all pure. Then it's these others. <coughs> and, and, when you, and I ask myself, what does that mean to be pure? That doesn't mean surely that I'm perfect if it's a not. And when you compare the verses above, the purity is not lying against the truth. And the, the truth is that we can be arrogant. And those who are arrogant lie against that truth. They don't, they don't claim to be arrogant, but they are. And the purity is, is, to, is to seek humility and, and to fight arrogance, right? And that's where it starts. I recognize my peace with the Lord is through my humility. It's not because of how good I am. And when I recognize my peace is there, that's where I start with my peace with other people. And we have to be careful. We'll sound a, a lot like it's us against them, even in this room. Mm -hmm. It's us against them. That It's not us against them. It's us trying to help all of us be not arrogant, but humble for the Lord. I would say yes. I, I would agree it, it, to a point, yes, it's about helping each other. Um, it is about using a different kind of wisdom. And not intentionally making enemies, but by living according to a different kind of wisdom, it is going to be a natural rub and tension. Because we're just going to operate by different standard of the way that it is. Outwork, outworking. Um, so no, we don't go intentionally make enemies, but sometimes enemies are going to be made because they're going to be confronted with their own selfishness. Just like I was when I, come, when I meet someone else. Um, very quickly again, please use the Bible in your hands. Please grow intimate with that. James would tell us at the very end of the day that everything comes of what you mentioned. It, it comes from the word that you hold. And we're following the living word, which is Jesus himself. Every day we're going to be tempted to go a completely different path and use a completely different thing. Don't sacrifice what God has given us so that we can have something else. Use what you have in your hands. Uh, it is God-breathed, and it is profitable, and it gives us everything that we need that will produce the purity and the gentleness and the meekness. I know that sounds that to us 
we know this, but it's surprising to me sometimes that we've made decisions and we're surprised. Kind of what you were talking about a second ago, that something didn't happen. Use what you have in your hands, please. Lead the way with your family in using the Scripture. Uh, it has everything that you need. Bill. Yep. Yep. We'll prove ultimately the wisdom that we have internally that no one hears or sees. It ultimately will reveal itself. And that's, that's the point of this. So thank you for being here. Class is yours.